No, it's absolutely super to be to be here. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, I did go to grad school just uh, down the road in Seattle, and I can tell you that when I was whenever I was in Seattle, I looked up the road and went, "Oh man, I, any chance I get, I want to try and visit uh, uh, UBC in Vancouver." And I unfortunately only got a couple of chances to do that. So super glad that. I can do that uh, today and, and share some fun stuff with you. And uh, that is my goal, is to share a lot of fun stuff with you. I will say right off the bat, once the fun stuff comes back, whoops, there we go, no, yep, there we go. Uh, right off the bat, uh, there's my email and uh, various ways you can get in touch with me. Uh, I will answer the question that many students ask me in the first day of class, can I get you a copy of your notes? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, you can. Uh, I don't give my PowerPoints out to my students because the research is very clear that if you do give out your PowerPoint slides, students will not pay as much attention to it. So uh, if you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, I do that all the time, that is something we can definitely tackle in the, the question answer session. But right there, uh, that's my goal. Whenever I talk about teaching, whenever I teach, I tell my students that just about every single thing that's going on in this class is based on research. So you may look at my syllabi and go, oh boy, there's so much work that I have to do. Rest assured, rest assured that every single thing in there is based on research. I have put it in there because the research shows that it works. And you will be amazed at how much griping it cuts out, right? Once upon a time when I first started teaching, there was a lot of griping about group work and, and can I have your PowerPoint slides? And, and now I support all my decisions with the scholarship of teaching and learning and the griping is next to non-existent. It would be a joy and an idealistic world if it became non-existent and I think something would be wrong if they didn't care enough to gripe. So I'm glad there's a little bit, but that is why I think I just love the fact that the tools that most of us as social scientists have can be so useful in the classroom and in teaching and learning. And what I want to do with you today is share some of those uh, things that I've learned from, social, uh, from psychology, but more importantly, I'm going to start at a 30,000 foot level and talk about learning in general, all right? I'm going to start talking about learning in general, namely how do we cultivate learning, and there's going to be a reason for why I have that oyster over there. Uh, I want to start with a, a metaphor, and then I'm going to walk you through how this metaphor can be used to really help us change how we teach and learn, and how we step into the classroom. We have a goal that we can chase down that I believe will really go and help uh, students out a lot better. Okay, so that's the plan, that's the plan. So, um, <clears throat> why do we need to start at the 30,000 foot level? Because ladies and gentlemen, whether you are in Canada, and uh, you are lucky to be in Canada, given some of the things going on in America right now, uh, we won't get specific, we don't need to, uh, but you know, there are a lot of things going on. Uh, in the last election period, we saw that many politicians didn't have a really good read of science, that too many politicians in particular, because they were uh, on, the, on the front line, uh, clearly showed that they weren't paying attention to research or data or knew how to think critically. Worse, and this is most recently, this was an article just written last week, we knew that we are now, if things weren't bad enough, we are surrounded by fake news, right? So once upon a time, you could say, oh look, I'm well informed, I read my Facebook feed, but we now know that that's not good enough, right? Your Facebook feed could be lying. And of course, yesterday, if you watch the clips of a certain news conference, apparently even CNN was accused of being fake news, right? So who is telling the truth? But more importantly, how can we tell what's fake from what's not? And quite honestly, in this whole buzz about fake news, it just strengthens, it just reinforces our need in higher education to improve quality. Because we can get our students to think more critically, if we can get the citizens of our countries to think more critically, there will be less of this fake news causing people to do things that they shouldn't. So for me, boy, this is such an important thing. I mean, each of us can fly the flags for our disciplines. Ooh, engineering is the most important, or psychology is the most important, or chemistry, or physics, or biology. But what's most important, I think, is to get more people to be able to think critically. And every time you and I step into a classroom, we are in a position to give our students the skills to do that. So 
That's why for me, when I teach, I go, how can we improve the quality of higher education? How can we improve learning? And I like this notion of the pearl, all right? Let me tell you a little bit about the pearl. Anybody know how a pearl is formed, by the way? Pearl? No? Big nodding? Yeah, give me a sense. How is, how is, how is the pearl formed? Right? Okay, that's, that's a lovely nutshell. Grain of sand falls into an oyster, it turns it into a pearl, right? So yeah, let's get a little technical, right? Here's my, the interdisciplinary portion of my presentation, right? Uh, this is how a pearl is formed. There's, there's uh, you know, the, these different layers here. And indeed, as you mentioned, some foreign body gets stuck in there. Uh, and what happens is the, the pearl starts secreting these different layers that form around that foreign body, and lo and behold, a, a pearl is formed. Okay, short nutshell story, right? Now, that foreign body is an irritant, all right? And that irritant causes that pearl to secrete things. And for me, as odd as this sounds, I realize that I want to be an irritant in the classroom. I want to be an irritant that makes students think. I can still remember, I was walking down the corridors behind two students. And one turned to the other. They had just come out of one of our large classrooms. And one turned to the other and said, man, what's this active learning? Why doesn't he just lecture? That's, that's what these, you know, that's what they said. I, why doesn't he just lecture? I just want to sit back and take stuff down. So I go, no, you know what? I want to be that irritant. I don't want you to be able to just sit back down there and do whatever it is you're doing. All right? And because here's why, right? We can substitute, instead of formation of a pearl, let's look at formation of learning. All right, let's look at formation of learning. I think there are lots of elements of the pearl here that nicely map onto higher education. So for example, for example, instead of that foreign body, when we faculty step into the classroom, we introduce new ideas. And for most of our students, for most of our disciplines, those new ideas can and should be some sort of irritant, right? It should make you think. Because that's what you're paying for education for, right? If not, I mean, why come to college? You want to get something. So it's this, these new ideas, but we are introducing these new ideas into prior knowledge. And it is so important for us to be cognizant of the fact that everybody we talk to, and even as I talk to you, you are sitting there with prior knowledge, right? And you listen to what I say, and for the most part, you're non-consciously mapping it against that prior knowledge. And even if it, it is slightly discordant with that prior knowledge, for the most part, you're going to stick with your prior knowledge. That's how we are as human beings. And that's why psychology comes in. We have a confirmation bias, right? We have a confirmation bias to believe and, and look for information that supports what we know. So we introduce these new ideas in the classroom. It's sitting with this prior knowledge. And the reality is, right, what we want is that intellectual engagement. Now, if that intellectual engagement doesn't happen, no pearl is going to be formed. If those layers are not secreted, no pearl is going to be formed. Okay? But just like we need to be aware of that prior knowledge, we've also got to be aware of that mantle or life. All our students have a life. right? Many of us faculty forget this. I often, when I first started teaching, I would think my class is obviously the most important thing, isn't it? But it, right? But it's not. Our students have lives just like those many times that we would wish other people realized that we faculty had lives too. Right? There are people around us. There are other things we do than do research and, and teach. And people forget about that. But we've got to be particularly cognizant of that when we teach because sometimes we may be having students do too much that the rest of their lives doesn't allow them to do. I am not saying just because somebody works 30 hours a week, you should cut them some slack. No. Stick to your teaching philosophy. But as you develop your teaching philosophy, I think it's important to be cognizant of all those other things that they're doing. Right? What are average course loads? Right? What's the average amount of work going on? What are those bottlenecks to learning that those students may have that their, their lives are, are causing for them? So it's this life that's out there. And all of this needs, all this learning needs to take place amidst all these factors. So for me, I think when I introduce those, when I introduce those new ideas, right, in, and, and I'm cognizant of the prior knowledge and all the life that's going on, then 
I think what happens is I want that pearl to form. And for me, my goal as an educator is for that learning to be lifelong learning. Okay? And that's going to be a big theme of today is how do you know that your students have learned? And more importantly, what is learning? All right, I can still remember, I had this horrible experience when I went to a faculty member when I, when I was part of a, some departmental assessment. And I said, uh, I need to know how your students are doing on this certain departmental learning outcome. And they gave me their grade distribution. And I said, no, no, no. For these certain departmental learning outcomes, how do you know how they're learning? And again, they sent me back their grade distribution. And I said, your grade in class does not answer the question, have they achieved learning outcome one or learning outcome two? It's not. And I think there's this disjoint. And far too often in higher education, there's a disjoint between what we do in the classroom and actual good, strong measures of learning. So one of the big themes I want you to watch for is spurred on by this. What is learning? And I want to set the goal for myself and, and us in general to go for lifelong learning. When a student comes out of our classroom, I don't just want them to know enough that they do well on that final exam. I want them to know enough that they can use it in their lives and that they can remember it downstream. Okay, that's lifelong learning. That's the pearl that I want to go for. Okay, so how do we get there? Little reminder, that's my classroom. Actually, it's a, a little larger than this. Uh, I teach introductory to psychology, uh, 250 students. Uh, in case you're wondering why they have little name tags on there. Uh, one of the things I do on the first day of class is take pictures of the entire class with name tags. And then I spend some time memorizing names so that the second day of class I can go in and I can call people directly. Because especially if Gary is tuning out, I can say, hey, Gary, you know, what do you think of the first day? And, you know, and bam, I've got them. Because immediately Gary knows, wait a minute, it's not just me, Gary, one of 250. I know. I see ya. You know, <laughs> it's there. Um, in, in case you go, how can, I'm not, in, in case you have that knee jerk, oh, but I don't have a good memory, I have some tricks. I'm a social psychologist, all right? There are tricks to make a class think that you've memorized all their names, <laughs> okay? Uh, ask, ask me about that later, but I think that is so critical. So anyway, so here's my plan. Here's my plan. What I'm going to do in the, next, uh, in the next 50 minutes or so, actually in the next 40 minutes or so, uh, is really unpack a little bit what lifelong learning is. I think I've given you that metaphor. And I say, I think all of us, we need to push for lifelong learning, quality learning that's lifelong. Uh, I'm going to really capitalize on psychology and give you a really nice summary, save you hours of reading, uh, and give you a nice summary of what some of the biggest factors are that influence learning. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some cultivation strategies. All right. So if we want to cultivate learning, again, using the pearl metaphor, uh, what are some cultivation tools that we can use to get that learning going? All right, works? OK, so works either one way or the other. OK, slow nodding, pretty good. All right, I know some of you may want to jump to the cultivation. Some of you want to jump to the factors. Go with what I'm doing, all right? It's going to work. So, so let's talk about this, this quality lifelong learning, right? I mean, I, as I said, let's be that irritant. Let's get people to really think. Uh, I think it is very easy in this day and age for people to sit back and just, OK, let, let it go. You know, let that lecture go over them. They copy some notes down. There's some cramming that takes place, and it's spilt back. But is that really learning? And that's the first question that I want us to, to think about a little bit. Because without that first question, all the other stuff is not that important. Okay? Uh, and I would bet that I would bet that a good number of you haven't. Don't hold yourself, or we don't hold enough. Enough of us don't hold ourselves to that standard of what is good learning. All right? It's very easy to go with the grade distribution and go, oh, look, a lot of my students are doing pretty well. That's enough. But is that lifelong learning? So, um, so how do we get there? Well, the thing is, just like pearls vary, the reality is learning varies as well. All right? Learning varies as well. And we've got to be cognizant of the fact that, that learning means different things to different people. Uh, one, of the, one of the best ways I like getting at that is when we take a look at what we want students to do, we can ask the question, what does higher education want students to do? All right? And when I ask this question, what do we want? And you say, OK, what does higher education want? Here are some of the answers that come out. All right? These are some of the words. We want to transform students. We want students to grow. We want to inspire them. We want significant learning. 
We want high impact learning. For those of you who haven't read up on the higher education literature, in a nutshell, that's some of the big jargony buzzwords out there. All right? And for each one of those jargony uh, buzzwords, there's a book. All right? <laughs> Creating significant learning experiences. Uh, I mean, mind you, it's not that that's the bad thing, right? But there's a lot to read if you've not run into this stuff, right? Here's another good reason where if you want a reading list for the summer, right, ask for the slides. And then, you know, you can, you can get some good stuff to put on your shelf. Uh, Definks, creating significant learning experiences. Really nice summary of a lot of the stuff out there. Um, this one, transforming students. Peter, uh, there's a lot of work on transforming students. Uh, this Peter Felton's little book on transforming students, fulfilling the promise of higher education really talks about it in a very, very nice way. Basically saying when somebody comes into your classroom, how can you transform their skill level into truly learning in a new way? Uh, this one, really slim little volume. If you're somebody who, uh, who attaches more weight to heftier tomes, then you may want the handbook of transformative learning. And I mean hefty tomes. It's literally that thick. It's packed with research, and if you go and never even run into the term transformative learning before, be prepared to be amazed. That's, I was personally, when I ran into that book a couple of years ago, it's just amazing how much work is, uh, uh, on transformative learning using that phrase has been done. That's, that's pretty useful. Uh, again, again we, not all of us have the time for that. That's a good starting point there. Um, high impact. Right, if that phrase, high impact learning practices, again, there's a very slim brochure put out by the AAC and you that says, here are 10 high impact learning practices that higher education should be using. Anybody want to take a guess at what some of those are? What do you think? What do you think at high impact learning practices? What do you think? Yeah. What do you think? Some, what do you think is a high impact practice? Something that universities do that really influences learning. Yeah. Pure Sorry? Pure teaching. teaching. Doesn't make it into the top 10, but it's up there. Yep, that's one of those things. What else do you think? A high impact learning practice, yeah. Get started, yeah, more applied stuff, right? More applied hands-on active learning sort of strategies, absolutely, right? Uh, along those lines, what's something every departmental curriculum you think should have? It's a high impact practice. Every departmental curriculum should have students doing these types of activities. Yeah. Experiential learning. Whether it's service learning, independent studies, research assistantships, high impact practice. Some of the other ones on this list, first year seminars. First year seminars. Universities that have first year seminars for students, higher retention, uh, students performing much better, students connecting more with the college. So. Great stuff out there, and again, as you can guess, there's also a bigger book called Student Success in College that takes each of those 10 high, high, low, high impact practices with case studies. So if you're somebody who who's, has a role in designing programs, that book there, Student Success in College, really nice reading because it provides you with some really great examples of what some schools are doing in using some of these high impact practices, right? Getting towards that, how can we have this lifelong learning take place? But that's just one of the questions, right? That's one question is, what do we want? I think it's a fair question to ask, well, what do students want? And the answer isn't exactly the same, all right? Uh, some of us, I consider myself, it's been a long, long time since I was a student, right? You sort of lose track of, with things. I mean, what do students want nowadays, right? What do you think? If you ask students, what do you want out of a college education? What do you think they'll say? What do you think they'll say? The average college student in North America would say they want this from a college education. What? Job. job. Yep, that's one of the top three. What else? Give me another. Somebody else. Jobs. They want to get a job. What else? Good grades. Good grades. Interestingly enough, <laughs> that doesn't figure in the top ones, right? You would think you would think good grades, but no, right? There's one other thing that may surprise many of you. Something that students say they want out of a college education. Yeah. Mm, that's, that's close to the jobs, help me get a job. Here's what it is. It's built good uh, connections. Connections with their peers, and they would hope to connect to a faculty member. Okay, there's a, yeah. Sorry, is that from, from before they start or after they uh, Actually, the studies have done this at various points of the process, and no matter where you look, these are the big ones that come out. All right, and actually, more close to your question, there's a great survey that was done by uh, Purdue and the Gallup. 
the Gallup Purdue study, they have just released their third version of this a couple of weeks ago. They asked college graduates, what were the things that best helped you succeed at college? All right, what were the things that best helped you succeed? And something that came up over and over and over again was good connections with a faculty member, a strong connection with a mentor. Those of you who interact with students, our power is tremendous. Every point of contact that we have with a student can make the world of a difference, can be a course correction. Okay, and I mean, it's astounding details. Success for in college, success in life. Students pointed to those connections, all right? Uh, when you ask them though, that's the interesting thing. They said relationships, they said connections. We we'll wanna form good friends, right? And you know, as I said, it's been some time since I've been in college, so good news again, there's some great stuff out there. My favorite is Richard Light's Making the Most of College. Great study coming out of Harvard where he asked a lot of students, tell me about your college experience. What are the themes that came out? Uh, more recently, this one over here, How College Works. Another really, really in-depth qualitative study where they looked at 1,500 students, interviewed the bulk of uh, chunks of them in focus groups and said, what's working for you in college? Eye-opening. For those of us who teach, reading stuff like this every once in a while will give you a different perspective on when you go back into the classroom, okay? So what we want as higher education is very often different from what students want. But let's go to what you said about jobs. What do employers want, right? What do employers want? Um, when you take a look at college, there are all these ideas that we have of what college is and what it should be, but in this day and age, it's very often the fact that people want, you look at what, how, what gets you a job. And the best thing to look at, and something I love sharing with students, is let's look at what employers want, right? And you can break it down at the K, S, and A's. Knowledge, skills, and abilities, all right? So many nationwide studies done on what employers want, all right? Uh, this one, one of the first ones done by Landerman Harold in 2003, right? It's been replicated a few more times. Ask employers, what do you want? And here are the top things that they found, all right? What do employers want? Learning skills, the ability to work with others, getting along with others, the willingness to learn, okay? Anything missing from that list that you think a lot of faculty go, wait a minute, there's something missing? What's missing? What's something that we faculty spend so much time on? Content, content, it's not there. All right, we spend all so much energy. Do you know these 14 chapters in intro psych? But content is not there. Sub theme people, we pay way more attention to content than I think we should. All right, we are missing out. If students don't have the skills to know what's fake news and not fake news, us spending time on them knowing some content's not good enough, all right? Or not the best use of our time. But that's what employers want. They want those skills, right? Because why? Most jobs nowadays, no matter what your discipline, you get on the job specialized training, right? You get on the job specialized content knowledge delivery, right? So don't get me wrong, content's important, but I think we spend too much time on content. That's what, that's what employers want, and you know what? Students are pretty savvy about what employers want too. Uh, in a study published more recently in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning in Psych, right? Uh, they asked students, what do you think employers want? And students were pretty close, all right? Listening skills, they got that, all right? Willingness to learn, they got that. There were some interesting things, I love this. Control one's temper. Okay, hey, you know, okay, I'm, I, I think as an employer, I would want you to, to be able to do that. It's just surprising that that sort of popped up on that list, right? So there's this world out there of what we want, what students want, and what employers want. But what's all of that got to do with learning, right? At the heart of this all, I think, is this need to have lifelong learning, okay? Because if you don't have that lifelong learning, a lot of these things here, these are skill things, and we need to train them with that too. These are skills that you can use through your life, right? So you know, when you look at that, it's not surprising that a lot of d disciplines have learning goals that get at some of this. Here's the APA, the American Psych Association's uh, five major goals for undergraduate psychology. And notice, like the theme I just mentioned, only number one is content. Look at the rest. Critical thinking, yippee. That helps you tackle fake news. Ethical and social responsibility, communication, professional development. 
four out of the five APA goals have nothing to do with content. And yet, most of what we do is talk about content. And why? Because it's easy. It's easy for me to deliver content to you, all right? But it's much harder to build these skills. And it's not just psychology, right? Uh, many of you have, I'm, I'm so I've seen the essential learning outcomes, the AAC new. A lot of the AAC, AAC news essential, essential learning outcomes are those skills, okay? Again, when we think about cultivating learning, when we think about lifelong learning, are we paying enough attention to cultivating those skills that our students can use in a, in a number of different situations? So you may go, of course, learning's important, but please notice when I'm talking about learning, there's a lot of stuff that I'm not talking about. When I say cultivate learning, I'm, I'm not talking about memorization. Far too often, learning is just memorization, right? If you're sitting here, you probably have heard about Bloom's taxonomy, right? And even if not, it's that nice, you know, coming from education, right? The, the, what, should, what should the students be doing, right? Rem and here's that, you want them to climb that hierarchy, not just remembering or understanding, but being able to apply and analyze and evaluate and create knowledge. But too many of our introductory courses, too many of them, not all, too many of them just focus on the remembering and the understanding, right? And I, you know what people say, but it's multiple choice. How can I do those higher levels? It just means writing better questions. One of my favorite examples, Steven Pinker's uh, intro psych exam, right? Good enough to be published in the New York Times education section. How cool is that? to have your exam questions published in the New York Times education section. And why? Because it's an example of multiple choice questions written to climb Bloom's taxonomy, okay? These are questions that just knowing the facts don't give you the answers. You've gotta do something with it. Especially if you're a psychologist sitting in this room, if you haven't taken Steven Pinker's exam, go take it. It's, it's, a, it's a fun challenge, and it's not easy. It's an intro psych exam, but um, those questions are great. And one of my goals is to write great questions like that, all right? So you may say, oh, memorization, but multiple choice. How can I do anything more? Yes, you can, all right? There are ways to write multiple choice questions where we can really get at much, much better learning, all right? And we don't just have to go for the facts. And here's why memorization is not enough. Why? Because our students, we, human beings, don't remember stuff for that long, all right? Um, my friend Eric Landrum and I did a, a study on how long do people remember stuff from intro psych. You laugh and you haven't even seen the data, right? <laughs> Which is a sad <laughs> story, but it's a true one. So, so here's the deal. We asked, we, you know, we looked at our students and we said, hey, how, long do, how much did they remember? First, the good news, or mostly good news, at the end of a semester, all right, let me ask you, what do you think the percent is? What percent of the material do you think students remember in their final exam for the semester. Cumulative exam, give me a percent. The average grade, or the average percent of remembering, what do you think? 80-ish, wow, absolutely. Did you read the article? 80, 80%. 80 so final exam, and now you may go, oh, my students do better, good for you. Some of you may go, our students do worse, okay, too bad, right? But on general, it's about 80%. But here's the deal. Here's the bigger question. How much did they remember two years later? Okay, we went back to students who took intro psych. We gave them exactly the same exam. Average score when they took it, 80%. Average score two years later, 56%. They failed. Two years later, all that stuff that we spent sweating through an intro psych course, getting them to remember, right? They remembered 56%. Now let's be fair. You're thinking, oh, come on, intro psych, it's one course and then you're gone. Right? What if you're rehearsing it? What if you're using it pretty often? Okay, we say, let's go to psych majors. So we went to psych majors, four years of psychology. They've taken all the courses. And we went to them in a capstone course. And we said, you've had four years of psychology. It's not just intro psych and you're gone. You've taken all these other courses. We give them the same test. What do you think? Staff, did they do better or worse? You want to say better. Okay, safe bet. They did better, but not by much. Okay, I mean, look at that, 62%. These are psych majors. These are psych majors who've taken all the courses required for the major. Yeah. Oh, isn't that a scary question? 
And I'm glad you asked it, because that's exactly what we need to ask ourselves, right? How much of the stuff that we teach in intro psych is important, right? Are we picking the right stuff? Are we too focused on content? Are we designing our departments so that our courses are building on each other? And, and I think the answer to a lot to that last question is no, right? And I mean, across the countryside, we faculty, because of the way higher education is set up, we teach what we teach in our class, and that's it. There's very little oversight, all right? We pick what we want. All right. Yeah, there are some slackers everywhere, but even the people working hard, they're still choosing what content they want, but there's very little of that, how is this connected to the other courses? There's very little of that departmental conversation. Right. So that's why lifelong learning, not just memorization. Okay, not just memorization. Here's another way to think about it. All right. Um, I think we need to cultivate learning and not just performance. And that distinction is really, really important. Uh, Soderstrom and Bjork, great article in 2015, they defined, if you, if you were saying, okay, well, what about the definition of learning? Maybe that will help. Well, th that's how they defined it, right? Relatively permanent changes in comprehension, understanding, and skills. That's learning. That's the cultivating, that's the learning I want to cultivate. What are we getting in most classes, multiple choice exams? We are getting performance, all right? And the problem is this. The way you study to perform is different from the way you study to remember something for lifelong. Okay? The average North American student crams. And there's good news and there's bad news. What do you want first? What do you want first? The bad news. Here's the bad news. You cram, and what you cram, you will not remember even a week later. The good news, you cram, you will perform well the next day. Okay? So the average student crams the night before the exam, does well on that exam the next day, and thinks, okay, cramming will work. We have reinforced a study technique that does not deliver long-term learning. Okay? Really, really crazy stuff. Okay? So cramming happens. And why does it persist? Because it works. Because that next part, that bad news part, most of our classes most of our departments, most of our disciplines do not have something in place to show students that that long-term retention is not there. We don't give students tests uh, six months or a year or two years later. There are few, few departments that have them reuse that stuff they've learned in another class, so they don't know that that study technique has not worked. And this is classic vintage cognitive psychology. All right, How you study makes a difference. And if you cram, great for the next day, not good downstream. Okay, so I think you know Bob Bjork at UCLA has talked about this often. He talks about you know difficult, uh, desirable difficulties, and I think that's another uh, lighter version of, of being that irritant, being that foreign particle to get that learning to go in. I mean, from my perspective, it's not just desirable difficulties. I mean, any difficulties I think that can get students to think is important. But I think that's the big deal here. When we want to cultivate learning, we just don't want to cultivate memorization. We don't want to just cultivate performance. We've got to push our students to be doing more than that. Okay? Um, so I think, I mean, there are lots of gradations of cultivating learning. Just to summarize some of this stuff, right? I think, uh, what are some of the key things that we need to do? I think we need to think beyond one class. We have to start thinking beyond one class. It's not just, okay, you've taken intro. Oh, okay, I teach research methods. I'm interested in whether they've got research methods. No, we've got to think beyond one class. Okay? We've got to think about how are classes in a discipline or a department interacting together. Okay? And I don't just mean sequencing. I mean actually using one thing, uh, in having students in a, a later class use material that they've uh, used in, a, in an earlier one. One of my classic examples there, if you want something to wrap your minds around, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, we, we, we teach us uh, uh, research methods is required. Right? All students have to take research methods before they can take an upper-level psych course. And in our upper-level psych courses, we started introducing exercises where they explicitly have to use the skills from research methods. So in my health psychology course, I, my students collect data on health behaviors, and they analyze the data themselves with SPSS as part of my health psych class. And in the past, it used to be, oh, I don't need to do that. But now, no, it's this connection. Right? If you've gone through research methods well, and have those skills, you should be able to do it in my health psych class, and in the psych of emotions class, and in the social psych class. In all our upper level courses, we have built in an explicit skill test where they have to use stuff from before. 
okay? But we've just started. We've got to do more of that. We've got to do more of that. So we've got to think beyond one class. We've got to think beyond content, okay? You may be thinking, but content's important. And uh, Jonathan and I chatted earlier about some fields like engineering, right? Where there is a licensing exam, where there is a professional program, it's much harder to play with, with content. But uh, even, even there, though, how, when and how you present the content can make a difference. Uh, in biology, for example, Craig Nelson in Indiana did, a, did something pretty interesting some years ago. He pulled some content out of the class and inspe instead spent more time teaching uh, students how to learn. And what he found that at the end of the day, or the semester as it were, instead of actually covering less content, he could cover more content because students had those skills early on that made them go faster with the stuff later on, okay? And I mean, that was pretty controversial where he pulled that out, right? But he found that it's, it was okay. And building those skills actually helped those students learn more, okay? So we've got to think beyond content for sure. Uh, I think we've also got to reclaim assessment. Uh, for the average faculty member, assessment is a very dirty word. For the average faculty member, assessment is something somebody higher up in rank than you tells you to do, okay, for the average faculty member. And the problem there is, especially in, in, in the U.S., when we get accreditation coming around, right, the uh, associate provost scrambles to the department chair, and the department chair scrambles to the faculty and says, oh, give me some assessment data. And we throw some together, okay, and then we use it for the accreditation, but there's very little conversation about actual student learning and how it can change things. Right? And the next time we look at it is when accreditation comes around again. And, and far too often, that's what assessment is in a lot of universities. But instead, I think we should reclaim assessment. We faculty members, and I like, I like uh, there's a great article by that, that Laurie Dixon wrote some years ago talking about using assessment and the scholarship of teaching and learning to enhance student learning. And, and she provides this nice little model that basically says, look, right, there's the academic assessment process Right? But there's also this process of the scholarship of teaching and learning. Making those intentional systematic changes and assessing the, the effects of those changes. But that and assessment should go together. When I teach a course, if I am paying close attention to whether my students are learning or not, that's my assessment data right there. And if I have been doing it, if I am doing it consistently, there is no sudden scramble for when assessment time comes around. But I think not enough departments provide the resources to do that kind of scholarship of teaching, learning, slash assessment, and not, or, or support for it. Okay, and we need to be better. We need to be better. Again, at my home university, we, the faculty senate, voted to put the scholarship of teaching and learning into the faculty handbook as an acceptable form of research. Okay, that makes more fac gives more faculty the reward for doing it. That does gives more faculty the reward for paying close attention to their classes and looking at learning in a slightly different way. Okay, but that's that's something that we have in our control. Okay, that's it's up to us. We can do it. We can do it. All right, but far too often we don't. But we can. End of part one. People good with that? Right, learning, cultivate learning. Let's cultivate learning. Right, not memorization not performance, we want that lifelong learning, big challenge for all of us, how do we do that? Okay, and that's, that's a big talking point, is what are the things we can do? There's some qu interesting things that have been rec suggested. One person suggested using course grades in one earlier course as a predictor of course grades in a later. Now, we know that prior GPA will predict later, so that only goes so far. Right, and the few the one study that I've seen on that has looked at whether requiring research methods and stats will help predict how students do in later classes, and the sad answer is there was no relationship. Okay, right there. Before I move on, that's our big challenge. It's all well and good to say lifelong learning, but we really need to come up with some creative ways to do it. And I think the best way to do it is little more interactions between courses in a department, so that one builds on the other, and there's some testing going on there. Okay. Now, it's not easy because there's a lot that influences learning, right? There's a lot that influences learning. Um, if you take a look at the literature out there, uh, you know, again, my, I love the pearl analogy because how do you create a good pearl? Well, there are a whole bunch of factors, right? And in case you're curious, nice little bit of trivia to share. This is not fake news. Uh, water temperature, water quality, the amount of chemicals, all these, there's a whole bunch of stuff that influences whether you get a quality pearl, okay? And when you look at students, it's exactly the same thing. There's a whole bunch of stuff 
that influences quality learning, all right? There's so many individual differences out there, all right? There's so many individual differences out there, but we rarely think about what those psychological individual differences are. Hence my borrowing from psychological science sub-theme to my title. There's a lot that we can learn from psychology. So, you know, what are some of those things for learning? Here's a snapshot for you, all right? You take a look at a lot of the research out there, and some of the major review articles are cited on the left, for those of you who like citations, right? Uh, if you take a look at many of these are meta-analyses, right? Here are some of the biggies. Predicting learning, right? Goals and motivation, student study habits, obviously ability and effort, right? Most, uh, uh, most often operationalized by GPA, right? We know for a fact that high school GPA or ACT scores or SAT scores predict a large per percent of variance in college performance. We know that, right? It still leaves a lot of variance to be tackled, but it predicts a lot right there. Uh, here are two that we don't talk about as much, okay? Social support. That Gallup-Purdue study that I mentioned, that really underlies the importance of social support. Students feeling supported in their learning. Grad students feeling supported in their mentorship, right? I mean, if you feel that support, you're more likely to perform better. It influences motivation, it influences learning. So a lot of good research out there on social support, but I don't think we spend enough time with those kind of rapport kind of things. Far too often, many of our universities allocate that to some other department or area, okay? But I think it's something important we need to think about if we want to really cultivate some good learning, all right? And one of my favorites is self-efficacy, right? Self-efficacy, the, 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 the student's perception that they can do it, right? I mean, Bandura was onto something, right? That self-efficacy in the classroom predicts a significant amount of learning, all right? But how often or when is the last time you've thought about your students and their individual variances on these things, right? It, almost never. But there's a lot of learning that could, be, that could vary because of these things, okay? That could vary because of these things. Uh, another major thing pulling from, from psychology, the, you know, is, is self-regulation. All right, and uh, oops, that's a little higher up there. When you think about self-regulation, I'm talking about going beyond just metacognition, all right? Basically having students really think about their behaviors, right? Are they planning well? Or are they organizing well? For example, planning, monitoring, and evaluating, right? Key elements of self-regulation, all right? And we now know that, that, that those key elements are extremely important, but very rarely do we foster or build self-regulation skills in students. And I think there is a great literature out there on self-regulation that doesn't make it into the general teaching uh, area enough, right? So we talk about metacognition. Oh yeah, thinking about thinking, that's important. And I'll get back to that in a little bit. But I think self-regulation is really critical too. Too many, we assume, right? We assume that students know how to learn and then we focus on the content. But I think that's a, a faulty assumption. All right? The average student is not socialized for college. The average student doesn't know what the best ways to study are. And as you'll see in about 10 minutes, the average student thinks, uses techniques that are not optimal. All right? And there's nice empirical data on that. But I think building self-regulation is key. I say it's not made its way into general teaching enough. There are some areas, education. Anybody here from education faculty, you've been doing it. All right? uh, this study just came out uh, in December, uh, Bembenuti. Uh, basically showed that when you take a look at uh, two key elements when he studied self-regulation, academic delay of gratification and self-handicapping, strong, strong influences on learning, all right? Basically showed uh, a mediation model, right? Where, where self-handicapping, self delay of gratification, significant relationships to learning. The students are doing it. Students are, are, are self-handicapping, right? Students, you know, practicing a delay of gratification. Here's that classic uh, the Walter Michel study, right? The marshmallows are back, right? That, that delay of gratification can go a long way. And in this day and age, when so many of us, notice I didn't say just students, so many of us are distracted by social media, when so many of us check out, like, enjoy Twitter and this, that, and the other, it's that delay of gratification that becomes a big deal. A key psychological phenomena that I don't think we pay enough attention to or tackle directly enough in the classroom. Okay, really, really good stuff from psychology. And making, and paying attention to it makes a difference. Uh, in this study, in this study, it was an intervention to actually increase self-regulation. 
right? This was in a, this was in a math classroom, right? And they increased, they actually trained uh, on self-regulation, goal setting, where students set their goals, so on and so forth, right? And when you take a look at it, the experimental group nicely scored better, all right? Nice, nice effect there where, uh, where what you see is in the experimental group, you see a nice increase in scores, all right? Uh, the low and high over here is, is uh, controlling for some individual uh, vari uh, vari variables there, right? The nice bottom key point to take about right now, that intervention group where they built self-regulation skills, they scored better, all right? So there are these things out there, right? There are these things that psychology tells us that I don't think we use enough in the classroom, all right? It's so weird, especially the psychologists in the room who know about all these cool psychological variables, and I do this myself. I have my psych hat on, and I think theoretically and robustly and control for things, and then I step into the classroom, and then somehow there's a teacher hat on that ignores all the stuff that my other hat, that I would think about with my other hat on. And I think we need to just have one hat, all right? And, 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 and balance those things better. Um, I think part of the reason for that is far too often in teaching, we don't think about it, we don't think about models of teaching. And, um, and I think any of us who've read the scholarship of teaching and learning for some time know that one big complaint has been that previously, and it's getting better, that previously, and Gary, I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, but previously the scholarship of teaching and learning has not been very theoretical. All right? There's been a lot of scholarship of teaching and learning that seems that hasn't used theoretical models enough. And now it's getting a lot better. It's getting a lot better. But I think that's one of the places where those two hats can merge. When we take a look at, you know, look, take a better look at models, for example, of learning. Right? This is Jim Grosha, Grosha out at Auburn. Very simple model for understanding teaching and learning. Right? Sort of carving nature at its joints. You know, assess it. Here are some major elements, the teacher variables, the learning variables in context and so on, leading into instructional processes, leading to learning outcomes. Okay? Nice simple first step where you say, okay, if I want to study this, if I want to really know what's going on with learning, here are some ways to think about it. But this is just the first step. There's been more. There's been more theoretical work. Um, this, this right here, uh, Stephen Chu and, and colleagues, really tried to unpack more what was going on and they took a sort of a version of, of Gra Jim's uh, Gracia's model and basically tried to carve it out into the main areas of, of influence, okay? And something like this, especially if you want to take a look at learning and what's going on, you can go, okay, you, here are some main factors to look at. All those psychological variables right here, the characteristics of the learner. There's so much going on there with the characteristics of the learner, okay, that I don't think we spend enough time on. And in about seven minutes from now, I'll give you some of those, so my, my big candidates for what we need to spend more time on, okay? Let me end this section, though, with, with, with really a big picture take. Um, and this next thing is something I share with my students often after the first exam. I've just told you that a whole bunch of factors influence learning, right? But a whole bunch of factors is all great for the, 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 those folks of us who like to read journal articles, but when it comes to teaching and learning, can we simplify that a little bit to change the dynamics of the classroom? And my answer is yes. And here's something that I share and I'm very big on. You know, I ask my students, hey, all those factors that predict learning, what do you think some of the biggest factors are? Okay, what do you, or I, I go a little further. I say, what do you think the single biggest factor is? Okay, what do you think they say? Not sure, what do you think they say? How much they knew? No, they don't say that. They, they point their finger in very one clear direction. When I say point your finger at the biggest thing that you think is influencing how much you learn. The teacher, right? The teacher, they point at me, you, it's you, it's all you, right? So, you know, you may say, okay, let's be defensive. No, it's you too and all that. I'm a big believer in empirical data, uh, right? Here's some empirical data for you. I shared this slide with my students, right? Uh, John Hattie, uh, University of Melbourne did a meta-meta analysis. Uh, he meta-analyzed 800 meta-analyses, okay? Uh, are you ready for the number of uh, students in this data set? This is just mind-boggling. 250 million, okay? A quarter of a billion students used in this meta-meta analysis, all right? I'm not trying to blind you with science. I just, it just staggers my mind, right? That he did a meta-meta analysis, took 15 years to do, 8,800 uh, meta-analyses meta-analyzed. 
And why am I giving you all these details? Because he took all of that and he gives us a percent of variance predicting learning. And this is what it looks like. Uh, he published this in, uh, uh, in 2015. He's, been, he's published this data of since starting from 2009 onwards. This version here came out in 2015. Here's what he showed. 50% is the student. 50% okay? of the variance in learning is attributed to the student. That finger pointing to the faculty member, oh, we are important. Don't get me wrong, 25%. And the rest is a whole bunch of other factors. Okay, peers, the home environment, so on and so forth. I show my students this graph without the labels, all right? And without fail, they put the teachers here, okay? Without fail. And my whole message here is, hey, people, yes, there are a lot of factors producing learning, but it's you do your bit, and by golly, I'm going to do my bit. But I can sweat my weight off, but unless you're doing your bit, you're not going to learn, all right? So... I will take full responsibility for doing my bit, but join me in this shoulder to shoulder. And I think that is so critical because it is so easy to sit back. That's why I like being that irritant. It is so easy to sit back and go, hey buddy, it's your job. I've paid my tuition. I've come to this good name school. I've paid my money. Do it, teach. Now, I can say 50% of the variance person is you. If you don't do your bit, this 25% is not gonna be amount to much, okay? All right, last little bit. So how do you do it, right? How do you do it? Um, some key things that I like to keep in mind. I have a little, um, my, my little reminder for what to do it, how to take a whole bunch of psychology uh, and do it is, is my goal as a teacher is to be firm, okay? Uh, and you may say, oh, you can do that. You're a full professor. Yeah, no, no, you know, I think all of us can be firm even if you don't have tenure, okay? Uh, and here's what I mean. I think uh, my goal is to facilitate learning, right? by introducing evidence-based strategies. And that's the key, okay? I never go into class and say, do this because I say so. I never say, do it my way, or my way is better than their way. I say the way that works is the best way. That's an evidence-based strategy, all right? It's, it's not your way or my way, it's the way that works, all right? So uh, practicing that evidence-based strategy, so far so good, right? But then I think it's important Classic psychology, reward the optimal use of techniques. If your students are doing things that you've suggested that is optimal, reward them for it. But even that's not enough, all right? And that's where my M comes in, to be firm, I mandate stuff, all right? Uh, I get a little crazy sometimes and I say, you know what, if I have read these articles or if I've done the research and I show that this way is, has empirically shown to, to increase learning, me not doing it that way is almost unethical. All right, almost. Actually, I can take out the almost. It's sort of unethical. If you read an article and it says, this is not the way to do it, and you still do it just because you don't want to take the time to change, yeah, that's sort of unethical, okay? So I think that's the key thing over there. I've, I've hit a lot of, some of these things in there. Um, here's where psychology comes back. I think increasing metacognition, I mean, to facilitate learning, I think increasing metacognition is key. I don't spend too much time on that because I think by this point we're pretty familiar with metacognition, right? But I think increasing metacognition is key. Um, my favorite example is really getting students to ask questions, right? Because at the heart of it all, metacognition is thinking about thinking, right? But th thinking about how much you know. And I think we need to start students asking themselves that question of how much they know as early as possible. Okay, as early as possible. I think we need to get students to question. We need students to question their learning early. One of my favorite examples is in, in intro psych, I use the phrase, show me the data, right, to try and be evidence-based. And this is very handy for fake news, right? If you want to examine fake news, ask to see the data, right? And, you know, people got into it. For those of you who are a little older, you may remember the movie Jerry Maguire. There was the show me the money thing. I, you know, could nicely play with the show me the money, show me the data. People got into it. But then I realized there's a whole bunch of students sitting there going, what exactly does that mean? Sounds all nice and I like to chant it, but what does it mean, right? And I think getting students to ask that, what exactly does that mean, what you just said, providing more opportunities for students to ask that question is important. Simple pragmatic tip, but provide more opportunities for students to ask questions early on, early on, all right? Same thing with mind wandering. We know minds wander. There's good news and bad news here as well, okay? The good news is it's not 20 minutes. 
The bad news, it's still about 40. Okay, but minds wander. Minds wander. They do wander. So let's be cognizant of it. Let's be cognizant of it. If we know that is a natural psychological phenomena that minds will wander, all right, let's do something about it. One little nudge there is that there are two types of mind wandering too that we need to be cognizant of, all right? There's on task mind wandering. So you're thinking about something else related to what I'm saying, but your mind is still wandering versus the complete mind, you know, off task mind wandering, which is, ooh, where's my next beer gonna be? Okay, yeah. 40, the, so, the, some, so the, um, t or some, one of the best sets of studies were published in 2015 uh, and, and nudge me later and I'll tell you who. But what they did, and, and the reason I say it's one of the best sets of studies is they, for uh, an entire semester, they mi measured mind wandering in every class of the semester. So they came up with this huge map of mind wandering by day of the week, by week of the semester, just one of the best data sets that I've seen on mind wandering. And what was basically what they showed is number one, yes, mind wandering happens, but there's a huge difference in the relationship between mind wandering and test scores. So not all mind wandering is bad. As you can guess, the off task mind wandering, that's negatively related to, to, to test scores, okay? But the on task mind wandering, they're not paying attention to what the instructor is saying, but their mind is still wandering. That actually didn't hurt long-term learning. It did hurt the quiz that they then took, not surprisingly, right? But it did not hurt long-term learning. So some really cool stuff about mind wandering, it happens, but it's not all bad stuff, okay? And, and my key point there too is, we need to target to the psychologist. So if we know it's happening, let's build something. Um, Schachter, uh, Schachter published uh, a couple of years ago on a nice study that he did at Harvard where, Knowing that students' minds wander, nice little simple classroom intervention to make sure that students' attention is brought back to the classroom. Nice little techniques in that article that show, here's how you bring students' attention back to the classroom, bam, mind wandering dropped dramatically. Okay, nice, nice scholarship of teaching and learning there. Here's an intervention, we know it happens, let's do something about it, okay? Um, here's another classic from psychology. Actually one of the, yeah, actually go ahead. See, and, and that's exactly where that whole thing about, for the longest, I, I, I almost put it at the level of myth where they say, oh, in, in 20 minutes you've lost them. That study that I was mentioning nicely says, you know what, that's not the case. Now, your question is a little different in terms of what's attention span in, in, in general with all, you know, and, and I think the, the, the temptation is to think, oh, with technology and multitasking and so on and so forth, the attention span is lower. I haven't seen actual data that nicely captures what it is right now. So you ask some folks and they will throw out, oh yeah, yeah, no, now it's only 10 minutes. And then you go, show me the data, uh, it's not there, okay? So there are some studies out there, one of my favorite bits of data that I also share with my students in, 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 in context of mind wandering is this one. Here's a great number to share with your students. Um, researchers have actually calculated the actual amount of time that it takes when you switch your attention from one task to another. So if you are sitting here listening to me and then you go, ooh, did I get a text? That switching to your phone takes 400 milliseconds. You switching back to me takes another 400 milliseconds. You do that switching enough times, those milliseconds add up to a neural, a neural bottleneck, right? Where they've actually shown that the neural pathways are firing actually uh, changes and creates this little bottleneck to learning if you are somebody who's constantly switching your attention, right? Another one of my favorite examples uh, to tell students in that thing, this whole 400 second millisecond loss, right, that you've, act it's 400 milliseconds is not a lot, but it adds up and it changes how your neurons are firing. Another big thing students say, oh, but you know what? M phones can multitask, and I say, yeah, phones have two processors, you don't. Okay, and that's another true story, right? I mean, the Apple iPhone, it can multitask because it's got more than one processor. It's wired to do that. Our brain is not. Yeah. Right. So, so there's there's one activity that I've j used once 
that's pretty useful. And this is the class, especially in the big class, a uh, group of students line up in front, right? They first tap each other on the shoulder. It's the classic, you know, the moment you get tap, tap on, right? So first they do it. First they do it without any distractions. You time them. Then each of them are told to, to text one message, right? And then they do it totally the, the amount slows down. So number one, that's a very physical doing kind of activity. Quite honestly, right now, there's such a great body of scholarship of teaching and learning out there that I bring data from studies and show, show, show it to them. So for example, you know, in multitasking, and you can email for me for this, I have actually a, a, a set of slides that I'd be willing to share all on studies with students that show that when they are multitasking in the classroom, it's going slower. I hear ya. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, so so one thing that a colleague has done and also published along these lines is actually and 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 she's taken something low stakes. So for the purposes of demonstration, for the purposes of demonstration, she uh, either had students text or do their normal texting behavior, all right, during a 15 minute lecture and then gave a quiz, right? versus another condition where same lecture, no texting allowed, took a quiz, showed the differences in scores. So a little trickier to pull off. Obviously, it's got to be no stakes. You can't play with students' actual grades. But it's those little things like that that can go, go a step forward. Yeah. So really interesting little uh, variations on the theme. Here's another big one, social psych, uh, classic social psych. Far too often, uh, here we are in early January. What happens in January? People want to lose weight, right? And they visualize the goal of a swelt, a nice thin self. What social psych shows quite clearly is that when you visualize the goal, you don't put things into place to really help you get to that goal well enough. Instead, you need to visualize the process. All right. So to put this into terms, uh, when I was at UCLA, Shelley Taylor did a great study with uh, with statistics classes. Right. One group was told, "I'd like you to visualize getting an A." Think about how good it feels. Ooh, you get that A, you tell all your friends, I got an A in statistics. Twice a week, visualize that A. The second group was told, I'd like you to visualize all the things that distract you when you're studying and come up with what you're going to do about it. Oh, that person comes in and says, hey, Gary, let's go for a movie. You know? Oh, hey, Catherine, you want to come down and you know, check the show out with me. Visualize those things and visualize what you would do to say no so that you can keep studying. Nice, simple manipulation. They did this twice a week. Right? Looked at exam scores on the first exam. Lo and behold, people who visualized the process scored almost a whole grade higher than people who are visualizing the goal. They were visualizing an A. But no, they missed all that stuff. This is the equivalent to you or me going, oh, packing our bags with all that stuff we're going to do over the weekend. <laughs> right? Not thinking about what is going on that weekend. <laughs> right? And then we come back on Monday and go, oh, didn't open my bag. You know? <laughs> uh, again, I like the good old Rocky analogy. You know, Rocky, Rocky Balboa doesn't end up in that classic right ahead, right? He starts with that slow slog, right? It's hard work. Learning is hard work. It's not easy. It's not easy. People think, oh no, I'm going to run up to the top of those stairs fully fit right away. Instead, you got to go, no, you got to train. It's hard work. And I think what I do in my classrooms is not just, I say visualize that process and make effort transparent. All right. In some classes, it is going to be tough, and if if it is difficult, yeah, that is normative. If you don't know that it's norm, it's difficult. You probably haven't looked at the assignment yet. Okay, and and you and you laugh, but that's the sad reality, right? When they look at the assignment, they go, "Oh my gosh, this is tough." Yeah, that's why I gave it to you three weeks ago. <laughs> you know, so it's those little. I think it's those things like that. Uh, another big psychological thing, mindsets. By now, I trust you've, you've run into this a lot, right? Some people have fixed mindsets. Some people have a growth mindset. Um, the good news is, again, interventions show that you can change mindsets, right? Uh, Paniscu and colleagues showed it in, uh, uh, in, in about a, a sample of 1,500 high schoolers uh, published in 2015. They more recently, I mean, right now, they're doing that with college students. 40-minute intervention. 40-minute intervention changed students from having a fixed mindset thinking that how you're born is how you are, into a growth mindset, thinking that you can change how you are. Uh, and this is so important, especially after exams. After my first exam, I have a little chat with my students about mindsets. Why? Because the, the psychological research shows that somebody sitting with a fixed mindset in the face of failure actually work less. Okay, Hear that. 
somebody with a fixed mindset, because they think it's fixed, they actually put in less effort into their studying. Okay, another nice psychological thing we can capitalize on. Motivation is big in psychology. There's a big literature on motivation, right? Uh, one of my favorites is pulling stuff from gamification, right? And here I am not saying make your classes a video game, all right? When people hear gamification, some people think, oh, make it a video game. No. There are actual techniques that games use, all right? There are actual techniques that games use. For example, choice. Games give a person choice. Games give a person second chances. Games give a people badges and levels, right? There are challenges that you move from one challenge to the other. That's gamification. It's not just, ooh, let's play a game, all right? Don't get me wrong, a little bit of games and playing is fun. But true gamification, there are techniques there that are really, really powerful to help motivate people, all right? One of my favorites is the, is, is the badges. In my department, we've started a badge system where students can earn a badge for writing in APA style. Students can earn a badge for correctly analyzing SPSS data. Students who earn that badge, we don't have to repeat those assignments with them. Okay? And we can focus our resources on the students who haven't earned their APA badges yet. We can focus our SPSS resources on the students who haven't got their SPSS badges yet. Okay? And it's been really helpful. I mean, we have 400 majors. We have 400 majors. 14 faculty, really, really helpful to say, okay, here's how we can allocate some stuff. And it's coming from gamification, right? Uh, if you're even mildly interested in that, gamification, education, and business, wonderful, wonderful book. Just multiple chapters on how you can use various techniques from the science of gamification to actually improve uh, learning and teaching in the classroom. So really, really neat stuff there. Uh, other, other real quick stuff in facilitating. <sighs> Another psych phenomena is habituation. Our students habituate. Right? People complain, oh, they don't read the syllabus. Yeah, because all our syllabi look exactly the same. I've jazzed mine up a little bit. All the information is exactly the same, but I've moved to a visual sil syllabus. Okay? Automatically, students read it longer because it looks different. Okay? It's not watered down in any way. It's just got images. It's just in color with all the same information. Okay? Syllabi, syllabi are important. All right? And uh, let me tell you, shorter syllabi doesn't mean it's going to be read more. Nice little study came out a year ago, uh, compared short syllabi, one to two pages, medium syllabi, five to six pages, long syllabi, uh, 12 to 15 pages, right? The students who got the one to two page, page syllabi thought that their instructors were the least knowledgeable, the least organized, the least credible. Here the instructors thinking, oh, short syllabi, they'll read it more, backfired, okay? So, Stuff we can do with our, our syllabi. A lot of other cool psych, uh, social psych stuff out there. Um, e email, communicate with your, right? Build rapport with your students. The, the pre-class or post-exam email builds that rapport. Remember I said social support? That connection. After my big intro psych exam, I email everybody who fails. Thankfully, it's not that many. And everybody who gets a really high A. Short, simple email. It's cut and pasted, but I change the name. Immediately builds a connection. And, and I see more interactions with them, okay? Uh, classic social psych of first impressions. Dressing well makes a difference. M you know, uh, this, this goes back to Ambadi's uh, thin slice of behavior. Five seconds, right? Five seconds of nonverbal can make a difference. On that first day of class when you have 250 people sitting down and you walk in for the first time, what they see can go a long way towards how they interact with you, all right? So I'm all for being comfortable with jeans and a t-shirt. And some faculty do that, but know the social psych literature, right? That how you dress can make a difference, all right? Um, same thing with rapport, all right? It is time well spent. Social, social support figures uh, big. Building rapport with our students goes a long way. Let me take that one step further. Uh, clinical psychology provides some uh, helpful hint here. Clinical psychology uses the term working alliance, where clients and therapists build this working alliance, and you can actually uh, uh, analyze it. Uh, Rogers, Rogers took that and modified it into a learning alliance for the classroom. Used a lot of those things for us faculty to, to look at. And uh, his scale, published in 2015, of uh, how to build a working alliance, some really helpful things for us to keep in mind in terms of our interactions with students. With again, the goal being here being, let's build that positive working alliance, and automatically there'll be more motivation, and so on and so forth. L 
Last couple of things, right? Study techniques. By now, I really hope you've run into Danlowski et al. 2013, right? Why? Because this wonderful review of the cognitive psych literature that relates to learning, right? If, if, if you're rusty on it, basically they took the top 10, they took the top 10 things from cognitive psychology and importantly, they rated its utility. And here are things that students do that have low utility. For example, students highlight low utility. Students spend, may spend a lot of time rereading their notes, low utility. Okay? They do it, but it's low utility. The students come into my office and say, look at all my highlighting. Look at how much I've highlighted. Good for you, but that's not effective. All right? The two biggest things, the two biggest things here, all right, practice testing and distributed practice. All right, the classics from social psych. We know this for some years now. The challenge is how do we best get uh, faculty to do it? Right? How do we best get faculty to do it? How do we really make sure that we can get our students to practice testing what they know and to spread out their practice? So I think that's, that's the challenge, is cognitive science says these are the two high utility things, but what can we do? How can we make sure that our students are repeatedly testing themselves? How can we make sure that they're spreading out their practice? I'm just not going to leave you with that teaser. I'll give you some suggestions, right? Here's where rewarding and mandating comes in, OK? Uh, especially because practice testing and spacing out practice is important. I figured it's one thing for me to just stand up and tell them that, OK? And I did. Many years, I said, oh, look, practice testing, distributed practice is important. But they didn't do it. So I started rewarding it, all right? I started rewarding it. Uh, what you see here is the number of times students took quizzes before my, in quotes, intervention, all right? This is 50 students, week one, week two, week three, OK? Barely crossing the 50, barely even once a shot, all right? Simple little intervention. I went and I said, hey, here's what cognitive psychology tells us. And if you do it, I will give you a bonus point. Well, actually, I was even bigger than that. I said, you practice the quizzes in the first week that they're open, and I will give you a bonus. I didn't say how much. I didn't say when, I just said, do it. That's a, that's a change. That's all it took. You will get a bonus for doing what's best for you. Okay? Uh, and in case you're wondering, you may go, oh, intrinsic, extrin intrinsic motivation. The bonus point is extrinsic motivation. Will the behavior persist? Absolutely. I followed this down the semester. The, the, uh, the, the number of times they took the quizzes stayed high. Okay, and this, is, uh, this was uh, three semesters ago. Every semester I've, I've, I've monitored it, stays the same, okay? I've now modified it, so I tell them how many quizzes, I mean, uh, how many bonus points. I tell them to take it at least three times in the first week. And as you can tell, that does two things. Increases repeat practice. It also spaces out when they're taking it. Instead of taking these quizzes just before the exam, they're now spreading it out. And we know that spreading it out is a really a big thing uh, that we need to get students to do, okay? The last part is mandating, all right? Um, this is, these are the, the straight correlations between uh, two types of quizzes and exam scores, uh, taking two types of quizzes and exam scores. And I just mandate that students have to take these online quizzes that come with the textbook, okay? I, 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 I add that rewarding part in there. I, it, it counts for 10% of their grade. It's a decent chunk, right? But I mandate it, they have to do it. And, and no matter which platform you use, these are three different companies, right? I tested three different textbook companies of materials. In every case, in every case, the more students did it, the better they're learning. Now this one, how you do it and can vary a little bit. This is one of the a really interesting area of scholarship of teaching and learning right now. There are some studies that show that yes, this positive correlation holds, but the class averages don't necessarily go up. So still a lot more to be done here. But if we know these two, these two cognitive things are doing something, we need to do what we can to put that psychology into the classroom, okay? And I think this, everybody procrastinates, but by mandating activity, I think we can get around a lot of that procrastination. Okay, we can get a lot, a lot of participants. My last pragmatic tip, group work, right? In a lot of my upper level classes, I have group work. And you would think, group work, it's pretty clear what you need to do, work as a group, right? But here's where I think that scaffolding becomes important. I have now mandated weekly goals, right? And I use our course management system, 
I use our course management system, and there are goals for each week. Every member, each group has to hit these goals per week. And because it's in our course management system, I can see the individuals who haven't contributed. So what do I, what do, I do? Two of the classic things that research shows helps. I've increased accountability. It is very visible who's participating and who's not. And I've created explicit small deadlines. Group work has changed dramatically. Okay? Just mandating those little goals. Now, I, some of you may be thinking, but isn't that too big, brother? These are adults. They should know how to do it. Not necessarily. Okay? And I think we lose an opportunity here to do this kind of stuff. All right? So, a whole bunch of really, really neat things that we can do out there. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope it's pretty clear that we can leverage psychological science to really cultivate learning. Thank you for hanging on in there.